Certainly feels like a Friday. A lot going on. We're coming on the air, top of the hour, with breaking news just into us. A look at the warrant and the property receipt filed by the FBI as part of its search at former President Trump's home in Florida. It includes 11 sets of classified documents, including some marked as top secret. We are live outside Mar-a-Lago with what Mr. Trump is saying today. Plus, the House is getting set to send Democrats' health care and climate spending bill to President Biden desk, how he plans to use that measure on the campaign trail. And one of the world's most famous authors attacked on stage in upstate New York. We're expecting an update soon on Salman Rushdie's condition. We'll bring it to you. Plus, a new entrant to the streaming wars. House Targan is riding its dragon to fight for HBO Max. They are mounting up against Amazon and Disney Plus in the battle for your attention. And a behind-the-scenes look at why one coffee giant will not make you pay extra for non-dairy milk. It's a campaign, years in the making. We're going to explain it all in our backstory later in the show. Good day and happy Friday. I'm Tom Costello in for Hallie. And tonight we are now learning the FBI has seized 20 boxes of documents from former President Trump's home in Florida. That includes information that goes beyond top secret. You're seeing the warrant there signed by the judge, FBI agents, and a lawyer for the former president. The property receipts show the FBI removed 11 sets of documents, three sets of confidential documents, three sets of secret documents, four sets of top secret documents, and one set of what's called top secret sensitive compartmented information. Now, that last group is a step above top secret that officials can only see on a need to know basis. The documents also include a grant of clemency to Mr. Trump's former aide, Roger Stone, you remember him, and information about the president of France, though it's not clear if it's the current president, Emmanuel Macron. The warrant also describes where the FBI searched the estate, including an area called the 45 office, as well as storage rooms. It's explicit that the search did not include rooms used by third parties like club members at Mar-a-Lago. Attorney General Merrick Garland requested the court unseal the documents, citing the growing public interest. And the former president did not stand in the way. The Justice Department filed notice that the Trump team did not oppose the release of the search warrant. Now, the former president is also claiming, without evidence on his social media site, that the documents are declassified. And the FBI didn't need to seize anything. And all they had to do was ask. It's worth pointing out, though, that Mr. Trump has copies of the warrant. He could have released them on his own at any time. For some Republicans, the warrant, it's not enough. Senator Lindsey Graham, a Trump ally and a frequent critic of the FBI, says the AG needs to release the information as to why the warrant was necessary in the first place. But the attorney general, Mr. Garland, has not signaled a willingness to release that information or at least the affidavit yet. One thing that's not in the documents that NBC News has reviewed anyway is anything that corroborates the reporting from The Washington Post. People familiar with the investigation telling The Post that agents sought classified documents related to nuclear weapons. It's not clear whether the FBI actually found those documents. Trump, whose sources say spent all last night talking to his lawyers, says any suggestion that he took documents related to nuclear weapons is, quote, a hoax. We have not heard from the current president. Mr. Biden has largely stayed silent as the DOJ has carried out its actions this week. Also today, FBI Director Christopher Wray says the agency is adjusting its, quote, security posture after that attack at the FBI field office in Cincinnati yesterday. We are covering this from every angle tonight. We have the legal breakdown with Carol Lamb. We've also got NBC's Ron Allen at Mar-a-Lago and NBC's Shaq Brewster is in Cincinnati. But we begin here in Washington with justice correspondent Ken Delanian, who got his hands on the warrant just a couple of hours ago. So, Ken, you've looked through all of it. Explain for us that top secret sensitive compartmented information designation. What does that mean? Great to see you, Tom. Top secret information is the highest designation of classification. It means information whose disclosure would cause exceptionally grave damage to the national security. 
But that sensitive compartment and information tag on top of the top secret means that it's even more sensitive. That because the, uh, it, what it means is that only certain people who are read into the program can have access to that information. It's compartmented. So only people who have a demonstrated need to know. So that, that would contain information like the names of CIA sources in the Kremlin or uh, NSA intercepts, national security intercepts of Chinese leaders speaking. So really, really sensitive stuff, Tom. All right. Talk us through now the areas of Mar-a-Lago where they laid out the search, where they actually went in looking. Yeah, so as you said in the open, they were specific about where they were searching and where they were not searching. So they, first of all, they pointed out that Mar-a-Lago has 58 bedrooms and 33 bathrooms on 17 acres. But they said that they were going to search something called the 45 office, which presumably was Trump's office, all storage rooms and all other rooms or areas within the premises used or available to be used by F. POTUS, the former president of the United States, and his staff in which boxes or documents could be stored, and including all structures and buildings. That what they were not searching were guest rooms uh, for club members of Mar-a-Lago or places essentially where there weren't documents stored. But as we know, Tom, it's a, it's a big place. The FBI was there all day. Yeah. Listen, the Justice Department is suggesting that these are not the former president's property. The documents are not his property, right? That is the, the property of the U.S. government. It appears, though, that Mr. Trump's team doesn't see it that way. Yeah, so this is a really interesting legal question. There, there are two issues here. One is, can Donald Trump, could he have declassified all these documents unilaterally, even if there isn't a record of that? And frankly, the debate is out on that. It's never been tested in court. A lot of experts we talk to say, that's ridiculous. There has to be markings. There have to be some kind of a memorialization of a president's decision, even though the president is the ultimate declassification authority. But others say, well, wait a second. All those rules are a product of the executive branch. And if he's the president, he can waive them. Uh, but leaving that aside, as, as our guest Carol Lamb has pointed out earlier today, none of the statutes in question here in this warrant require that the information be classified. So it's another question whether the documents are the property of the U.S. government and whether they were mishandled by the president. That's a separate issue from whether they were classified. And it looks like the FBI is going sort of going at this on both fronts, Tom. Yeah, the one thing that we don't have is the affidavit showing us why they conducted the search in the first place. Right now, NBC News is part of a group of organizations that try to unseal that information as well. Yeah, we're trying to get it. It's going to be tough, though, Tom, because the Justice Department is, is claiming that it protects sensitive investigative information. And what I'm hearing from the Justice Department is they don't expect that this thing ever would be unsealed. Uh, you know, this is the document that the FBI swore out to the judge where they established their probable cause. It has a lot of very sensitive information in it, including the names of sources, the larger scope of this investigation. It's a document they do not want to release at this moment, Tom. NBC's Ken Delanian, who has not gotten much sleep at all this week. Ken, thank you very much. All right, Carol Lamb joins me now. She's a former federal prosecutor and also an NBC News legal analyst. Uh, Carol, it appears the former president is facing potential criminal exposure under the Espionage Act and for the mishandling of records. Has anybody ever been prosecuted for this before? Uh, yeah, people have been prosecuted for this before. Obviously, nobody at the level of a former president of the United States. Uh, and, and generally speaking, people aren't prosecuted if they inadvertently stick a, uh, a piece of paper in their briefcase and take it home and it comes back the next day. That's not the kind of, that's not the kind of crime that DOJ is interested in prosecuting. But a lot of it depends on the nature of the document. And as Ken pointed out, there, uh, you know, these, the statutes listed in the, in the search warrant don't require classification. They, they don't require top secret classification. That's something that has gotten spun up that actually doesn't exist in the search warrant, but they did end up finding top secret, or at least what had been designated top secret um, and top secret SCI information at Mar-a-Lago. It has no business being there. So it's going to be very interesting to see what the department decides to do with this information they obviously wanted to get it back. That was very important to the, their reasons in the search. But now taking the next step to a possible criminal prosecution of who knows, um, the president yeah. or members of his staff or, or both, it's going to be very hard to say. I'm reminded that former National Security Advisor Sandy Berger under President Clinton, I think, was also held accountable for uh, having some documents after he left office. What could the penalties be, though, if anybody is found guilty for these kinds of violations? 
So it really depends what the violation is. If you take the Espionage Act, which um, regardless whether it's an intentional removal of documents for uh, for bad purposes or whether it's there's a gross negligence standard as well as well as as a possible charge for refusing to return the documents when the government asks for them back, that carries a maximum ten year sentence. There is the, there's a crime that is cited in the search warrant that is a three-year crime, then that just has to do with removing items that are actually supposed to be kept as part of the national record, as part of the record of the presidency. But interestingly, that even though it carries only a three-year sentence, it also says that anyone convicted of this crime cannot hold any federal public office again. Um, yeah. And the last, the, the last one is um, obstruction of justice, and obstruction of justice has to do with obstructing a a, um, a federal investigation. So, so there are a variety of crimes here that are actually cited in the search warrant. Carol, real quick, uh, the affidavit, uh, is that the type of thing we, we may never see? Uh, what is your expectation on the affidavit? I think all of your former federal prosecutors who are uh, legal commentators for you are shaking their heads saying, yeah, you may never see that affidavit. You know, when, when a federal agent comes in to a um, to a magistrate judge's chambers with their affidavit in support of probable cause for that search warrant. And these documents can run 100, 200 pages long, and they are telling that magistrate judge everything about the investigation. So um, it's these are this is still a somewhat early stage of the investigation. You know, they just got these documents from Mar-a-Lago, so they're not going to want to be uh, telling everybody everything they know about the investigation. Carol, thank you. We're very fortunate to have your expertise. Thank you very much. Carol Lamb. We want to go to NBC's Ron Allen. Uh, he is in West Palm Beach, Florida. Ron, what else are we hearing from the Trump team today? They've had a response at every turn of this, Tom, and they were uh, very vocal today in pushing back against this. Uh, one thing the president kept saying is that all these records were already declassified and that they're not top secret, therefore, because he can do this. And as you heard, there is some debate about that. Uh, he said that the FBI could have taken these things anytime they wanted because there was a process underway where he was cooperating. He said that his lawyers weren't allowed to be involved in the process. They had to wait outside. That's not true. And it wasn't true also uh, that they could have had these documents anytime they wanted because it was a subpoena issued some time ago. Back Back in June, we understand, and Merrick Garland said in his remarks that they'd made other efforts to try and recover these documents that were unsuccessful. The president has also been very political in his, his comments during the course of today. He's talked about his poll numbers being higher than ever before. He's talked about the number of candidates that he's supported and backed who've won primaries. He's talked about the midterm elections coming up and Republican fundraising. So he's clearly been trying to, take, to make political advantage of what's happening today, rallying his base, rallying his supporters while at the same time he has been constantly attacking the Biden administration, the Department of Justice, and the FBI for carrying out what they say was an unwarranted and unethical and, and outrageous raid. It's probably worth reiterating that the White House insists it knew nothing about this before the FBI conducted the, uh, before it moved into the Mar-a-Lago. Can we quickly ask you, though, you know, the, the former president spent a lot of last night talking with his lawyers. Do we know why they let the Justice Department unseal this warrant? Why didn't they just release it themselves? They had it. Yeah, and if, if they had released it, it would have shown what is apparently, or what many believe is incriminating evidence that he should not have had here at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, so they essentially were calling the AG's bluff, and he, uh, Merrick Garland, went through with the process and made it public himself. It, it, it doesn't seem like it's the kind of thing that President Trump, former President Trump, would want to be seen public. Although, again, he has yeah. gone to great lengths to castigate it and undermine the, the veracity of this and, and the legitimacy of this whole process. But yeah, I think the short answer to your question is, is that the president didn't want this to be seen publicly. OK, well, then I think you're going to answer my next question with the same answer. Uh, what about the affidavit, uh, <laughs> the information about why the FBI wanted to do the search? Uh, one would assume if they didn't want to release the warrant, they probably wouldn't want the affidavit released either. 
I, I can't imagine that they that they would, because anyone under investigation, as as the others, other guests have said, this is the document that has all the detail in it. It has all the uh, more detail about the allegation, names, places, dates, whatever, uh, spe- very specific information that the public will never see. And clearly, that's not something that anyone under investigation would want out there. Uh, it would be so much to refute. Yeah. It, it would just it doesn't I, I don't think that that's anything that anyone would ever want public if they're the target of an investigation. Veteran NBC News correspondent Ron Allen. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, NBC's Shaquille Brewster is in Cincinnati. Shaq, talk to me a little bit more about this attack that we had yesterday against the FBI office there in Cincinnati. What else have you learned? Well, Tom, there's a lot that we've learned since you and I last spoke about this time (laughs) yesterday, and that comes from state and local authorities who tell us the exact timeline of what happened. They say the man came to this uh, visitor screening center at the Cincinnati field office about 915 yesterday. They talk about a car chase that then ensued after he fired a nail gun at personnel and waved an AR-15. And then we know that there was a six hour standoff in that town uh, where the suspect eventually pulled over, fired at officers and engaged with negotiations for a period of time before officers shot and killed him after they say he raised his weapon at them. As things stand right now, the FBI is investigating all aspects of this incident. They're calling it an agent-involved shooting. There's not much more we'll hear from them, at least today or in the meantime. They want to go through their investigation. We know they're still at least processing. We saw some agents at the actual site where that standoff took place. But there's a lot more that they're investigating that they need to do before we learn the full details of everything that they know involving what happened yesterday. Hey, Shaq, a little bit more about the suspect's alleged online presence. It seems like he posted a lot of threats against the FBI uh, right after they searched Mar-a-Lago, right? That's exactly right. And, you know, we talked a little bit about the threats, the increase in threats against federal authorities after that search of Mar-a-Lago. People talking about civil war, people talking about engaging in combat. Those threats were done uh, apparently based on the suspect's social media profile. They were coming from the suspect himself. Uh, You saw posts telling them that he wanted folks to engage in combat. He said uh, when another person on social media came back and said, I'm going to report this to the FBI, he said, something to the effect of bring it on. So that will definitely be part of what authorities look at as they try to find a motive. But based on his online profile that our colleague Ben Collins was able to go through and really take an extensive look at, it does appear that this uh, attack and his actions came in response to what happened earlier this week. You guys have been all over the story. Shaq, uh, the director of the FBI, says he wants to adjust the agency security posture. Uh, What does that mean? And have you seen any signs of it right there in Cincinnati? They're not giving specifics about what they're doing to protect their agents, but they did send out a statement to the director of the FBI, Chris Ray, saying that all Americans should be concerned about the threats that his officers and his department has been facing. We also know that he sent out an email to members of his staff saying that their security is his top priority and that they'll be increasing the security posture around places like the field office behind me. So we don't know the specifics of what's being done, but the message coming from the leadership of the FBI is that this is going to be a top priority, and the attacks that you saw yesterday will not be tolerated. Shaq Brewster on the ground and on the story in Cincinnati. Thanks, Shaq. All right, we're following another developing story at this hour. We just heard New York State police say that Salman Rushdie, one of the world's most famous authors, is still in surgery at a Pennsylvania hospital after a brazen attack in which he was stabbed in the neck while on stage. They have now identified his attacker as a 24-year-old from New Jersey, in fact, from Fairview, New Jersey. Now, it happened this morning, just as Rushdie was about to give a lecture in upstate New York, a suspect ran up on stage attacking him and his interviewer. State police say Rushdie was then taken by helicopter to the hospital in Pennsylvania. The suspect, as we mentioned, in custody, and we are still awaiting for more details on a possible motive. Rushdie has faced death threats before, as you may know. His book, The Satanic Verses, has been banned in Iran and is considered by some Muslims to be blasphemous. That led Iran's leader at the time to issue a fatwa, an order calling for his death. NBC's Kristen Dahlgren joins us now with more details. Kristen, uh, give us a little bit more about what we know about Rushdie's condition. 
Right. Hey there, Tom. Well, the uh, New York State Police just updating us. And so we are just getting this information in. As you said, Salman Rushdie in surgery at this hour. They have no update uh, as far as what his condition is. But we are learning a little bit more about the attacker. He has been the alleged attacker named as Hadi Matar, a 24-year-old from Fairview, New Jersey. They say they still don't have a motive. The FBI is on scene joining with local authorities and looking at possible Possible motives, including delving into whether or not that fatwa and the three million bounty that was put on Salman Rushdie's head back in 1988 may have something to do with this. So that investigation still continuing. But it sounds like a terrifying scene. They described that at about 10:47 this morning, just before Rushdie was about to give this lecture, uh, a man rushed onto the stage, stabbing Rushdie at least once in the neck and once in the abdomen. An Associated Press reporter who was there described the attack as taking about 20 minutes and looked like Rushdie was repeatedly being stabbed or punched during this attack. Uh, he then was treated actually by a doctor who was in the audience. Audience members rushed to the stage, tried to separate him from the attacker. A state trooper was then able to take the alleged attacker uh, into custody as this doctor provided care. Rushdie was ultimately airlifted to a hospital in Erie, Pennsylvania, and that is where he is undergoing surgery at this hour, Tom. All right, Kristen, and, and you made mention of this. You know, he has faced death threats uh, for years. Uh, Iran banned his book, offered that $3 million bounty, as you mentioned, for anybody to kill him, and that forced him to live in hiding for a decade, but he has really refused to be silenced or to continue living in hiding. Right. And I remember the protests at the time. This was a really big deal. The Ayatollah Khomeini calling uh, for Rushdie's death and putting that bounty on his head. He had to live for uh, about 10 years, I believe, under British protection because uh, his life was in so much danger. Ultimately, uh, it was the Ayatollah, Khom uh, or it was actually Iran, that said they are not going to enforce that fatwa. And so, um, you know, he has been more public, but throughout uh, his entire life, even when he was in protection, he continued to write, continued to speak out, has been very visible. The state police also answering some questions about security, whether or not he had his own security with him. They didn't believe that he did. And uh, a lot of the audience members reporting that there wasn't a lot of security uh, at the time there. There was this one state trooper, also a few security agencies, but it wasn't high security. Security. They just check tickets uh, for people going through the door. So he's continued to uh, live his life in a very public way and not under the intense, intense security that you might imagine. All right, Kristen, thank you. NBC's Kristen Dahlgren, thanks very much. Uh, other news out of New York. New York health authorities announcing today that polio has been detected now in the city's wastewater system. The state health commissioner says the discovery is alarming but not surprising since it had already been found in suburbs north of the city. The once dreaded childhood disease was declared eradicated in the United States more than 40 years ago. In rare cases, polio can lead to permanent paralysis of the arms and legs and even and death. New York City Health Commissioner says the risk is real, but the solution is easy. Just get vaccinated against polio. NBC's Dr. John Torres is joining us now. Uh, John, I was surprised by this. The, the New York number of people who have actually been vaccinated is stunningly low in Rockland County, right? It's just about 60 percent. Can you talk about the threat of polio spreading fast when you have that low of a vaccination rate? And uh, Tom, you're right. The rate here is low. In per certain parts of New York City, it's below 60 percent, like you mentioned. Other parts, it's above 90 percent. Overall, around 83 percent, which is still below where we want it to be. Nationwide, it's around 93 percent of children are vaccinated against polio. The reason that's important is because once you're fully vaccinated, this is a success story for vaccines because you're 99 percent protected from polio, and that's usually lifelong protection. And so it's important they get this vaccine, usually three before the age of one, and then you get 
another one when you're age four to six time period, and then that's it. And so having such low vaccination rates, and like you mentioned, we haven't had polio here in the U.S. in decades. The last U.S. polio case was 1979. We thought we had eliminated it from the United States and most of the world. This is almost eradicated. It was only in two countries, Pakistan and Afghanistan. And from there, we're starting to see it crop up. London has some issues. Now, New York, like you mentioned, Rockland County, Orange County, New York, they found it in, in wastewater and now here in New York City. The concern is we live in such close proximity here in New York City, and this is a virus that's very, very catchy. If you think about r not, if you remember what that was, that's the amount of contagiousness of a virus. For BA5, it's around 6 to 10. For this one, it's almost identical to that, so it's a very contagious virus. It's easy to catch in situations like this. And before vaccines, in the 1940s, 35 percent, sorry, 35,000 people a year ended up paralyzed here in the U.S. Yeah. because of polio. It's a bad disease. Hey, John, have the, have the vaccination rates dropped because of the anti-vax movement? And then my second question is, what should parents be looking for? And I think that's part of why the vaccination rates drop. But I think, honestly, the other part of it is that people have just forgotten about polio. It's not a disease we've seen in our lifetimes. It's one of those ones that was eliminated from the U.S. back in the 70s. And so people don't think much about it. When it comes up to the vaccine, they say, you know, do we really need this? Because polio is not around. But the reason we get the vaccines is to keep those things from coming back because they're still here in the world. And for parents in particular, number one, like your expert mentioned, you know, get vaccinated. That's the most important thing that can protect you. It's a very safe vaccine, very effective vaccine. But also talk to your children about washing your hands. This is the type of virus that spreads by touching something, touching your mouth and getting into your body that way. And so talk to them just like we did at the beginning of the pandemic. A lot of hand washing. That's important. Dr. John Torres on a Friday. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your expertise. Coming up, the drought underway in Europe right now could be the worst in 500 years. Rivers are running dry and wildfires are forcing thousands to evacuate. How it's impacting the continent. Plus, the part of a pig that is now being used to help blind people see. That's one of our five things to know tonight. Bottom of the hour, we're back on News Now, and now to Hollywood, where award Emmy award-winning actress Anne Heche has been now legally declared dead a week after she crashed her car into a Los Angeles home. A family statement confirms that she is still on life support to determine if her organs are viable for donation. Her family says they've, quote, lost a bright light, a kind and most joyful soul, a loving mother and a loyal friend. Heche went into a coma on Monday after the accident. She suffered a severe brain injury. Police say Heche had drugs in her system at the time of the crash. A woman inside the house where she hit was also injured. NBC's Ann Thompson joins me now with more on this. And this is just a, a stunningly sad story. I understand that Heche's former partner, Ellen DeGeneres, has commented today. She did. In fact, Tom, she tweeted out that this is a sad day, and she sent her love to Haitia's two children, Homer and Atlas, her two sons. Um, but I think, you know, when you look back on Anne Haitia's life, one of the things that really stands out is 25 years ago, when she took Ellen DeGeneres to a movie premiere, it was absolutely shocking. And it was so shocking that Haitia says it really disrupted her career for a decade afterwards. She said she couldn't get a major movie studio to hire her because same-sex relationships w out in the open were not it celebrated the way they are today. There was no legal same-sex marriage. So it's interesting to think that in her lifetime, just how far society has come. Yeah. Now, this case, I understand, is being investigated as a DUI. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Uh, can you tell us what the police are looking at? Yeah, as you mentioned, um, they did an initial blood test, and in that blood test, they found that Haish had narcotics in her system. The question now is, because she is legally dead, will they do a second test? And that would determine just what those um, narcotics were. We do know the investigation is ongoing. Is It is expected to be completed. And then once that happens, the LAPD has basically two choices. They can close the case, or they can forward it to prosecutors. But at this point, we don't know which they're going to do. 
Tom. All right, and thank you. Ann Thompson in New York for us. Other big news in the sports world, Deshaun Watson. It's expected to play his first game for the Cleveland Browns tonight when they kick off their preseason against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Watson is still waiting to hear how long he will be suspended over the dozens of accusations of sexual misconduct that have been launched against him. Earlier this month, an independent arbiter said Watson should be suspended for six games. The NFL appealed, saying the suspension is too short. It wants him out for at least the entire season. Watson, meanwhile, is reportedly willing to meet the NFL somewhere in the middle. Sources tell the AP that he would be open to accepting an eight-game suspension and a $5 million fine. Okay, over now to the five things that our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, stocks rose sharply today. Really uh, an amazing run. It marks the fourth straight week of gains for the S&P 500, putting it now on track for its longest weekly winning streak since November. The Nasdaq also had its fourth straight positive week. And guess what? It's now in bull market territory. It comes as we're starting to see inflation ease up slightly. Number two, Nashville police say that Grammy award-winning singer Michael Michelle Branch was arrested Thursday for allegedly slapping her husband. According to an affidavit, Branch's husband, Patrick Carney, that he's the drummer, by the way, for the Black Keys, he told police that she slapped him during an argument. Carney's reps declined to comment. Branch's reps could not be reached for comment. Branch told People Magazine yesterday that she and Carney are separating after three years of marriage. Number three, housing officials in Seoul, South Korea say they will no longer allow permits for low-income basement apartments like the one seen in the Oscar-winning movie Parasite that follows a national outcry and calls for government action on social inequalities after three family members died in their home during the record flooding this week. Number four, Swedish researchers, listen to this. Swedish researchers say the implants made with protein from pig skin significantly improved eyesight. In 20 patients who had a condition that damaged their corneas, 14 of the patients were actually blind before receiving the implant. And two years after the procedures, they regained all or some of their vision. The people, not the pigs. Number five, park workers in Turkey say they rescued a brown bear cub that they think was high after eating too much mad honey. You can see it wobbling a little bit right there in the back of the truck, poor guy. The honey that he was eating was not Winnie the Pooh honey. It's a special kind of honey that actually has hallucinogenic effects, kind of like a bad night out on the town. The park workers took him to a vet. We're told that he is gonna be just, <laughs> just fine. When we come back, flash flooding in Las Vegas, making it rain inside casinos and hotels. We'll show you some of this monsoon's damage later in the local. So stay with us. We're back and we're looking at Europe. Uh, boy, has it been hot there, right? The heat is taking over. They're dealing with what could be, in fact, the worst drought in 500 years. In the UK, an extreme heat warning now in effect as they brace for another heat wave. Temperatures in some parts of Britain expected to hit 99 over the next few days. In France, multiple wildfires are burning right now. About 10,000 people have been evacuated. Firefighters from other European countries have actually been called in to help. And in Germany, the Rhine River is getting so dry that authorities are warning it could be just days away from closing to commercial traffic. Look at that. And that would likely lead to shipping delays and driving up costs in Europe. NBC's Matt Bradley is with me now. Matt, these pictures are just astonishing. I know you're in London right now. Uh, the heat wave is supposed to peak today or tomorrow. So how hot is it right now at, at 1130 or 1230 at night? Yeah, Tom, I'm going to tell you something, and don't tell anybody, just between you, uh, me, and the audience, uh, this doesn't feel hot to me. You know, I grew up in Washington, D.C., where you are now, <laughs> and the, the issue here is that for Britons, it doesn't, it feels really hot. You know, it, it, you have they're no not humidity, used to Matt. this kind that's, of weather. And actually, you have no humidity. That's I why. I mean, that's the issue. <laughs> no bugs. No bugs. <laughs> so, yeah. we, you know, we were looking at this. It doesn't feel that hot to you or I. 
But that's one of the things you notice when you live in Europe, uh, if you've lived in the States, is that actually there's no air conditionings. Um, you know, people don't water their lawns. It's not the same situation. It'd be like asking folks in Miami to get ready for a snowstorm. That's kind yeah. of what's happening right here. <laughs> so people are actually out enjoying it. This is a novelty. Yeah. For them. Well, you know, they like I, it. Uh, well, I mean, live. There is I an live. environmental catastrophe. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to step on you. When I lived in London, we went all summer without it's, it. It <laughs> rained good. every day all summer. I never put on shorts. So I think I would have taken the heat over over that kind of a summer. Listen, when we look at Germany's river, though, the Rhine River, it's not totally unusual for water levels to drop. But parts of the river are now getting too low for vessels to go through. Right. So what kind of an impact will all of that have when you're trying to carry goods and and uh, and, and shipping stuff through the one of the biggest countries in Europe? Yeah, actually, already on the upper and middle part of the Rhine River, we're already seeing restrictions on the boats that can go. You know, apparently uh, it's really up to the captains of the individual ships to decide whether or not they're going to traverse these waters. You know, we forget that actually riverways in Europe are still a major way of transporting goods. And when we talk about the environmental impact of all of this, we talk about agriculture. We talk about electricity and energy, but transportation is a really big one, especially on the Rhine River. It's a major artery. It's a major way of moving stuff through Europe. So this will have knock-on effects. And this isn't going to be lost on you, Tom, but we got to remember there's already an inflation crisis in Europe, here in the UK and in Germany, that actually is getting worse. It's peaked, more or less, where you are. At least that looks like it it's peaked from the statistics that came out yesterday. But here in Europe, here in the UK, we're still seeing prices kind of edging upward. This blocking one of the major arteries, one of the major transport methods, that's not going to help. Tom? All right, buddy. Thank you very much. Matt Bradley on a Friday night in London. Thank you. Stay cool if you can. Coming up, the new Game of Thrones prequel is preparing soon. We're getting into the high stakes for HBO and HBO Max. Plus, Pennsylvania Democratic Senate nominee John Fetterman is holding his first rally since having a stroke. What he's saying about his recovery coming up in the local. We're back and we do have a big breaking news story. A huge Democratic spending bill is now on its way to President Biden's desk after the House passed the Inflation Reduction Act along party lines just moments ago. The Senate passed the bill last weekend with a slim majority. Vice President Harris actually cast the tie-breaking vote. Now, the bill has funding to fight climate change, cut costs of prescription drugs, and it also raises taxes on some large corporations. The most independent analysts say it will not have an immediate impact on inflation. Still, it's giving the president and the Democrats a major legislative win just a few months before Election Day in November. Joining me now, NBC's Ali Rafa. A- Ali, uh, a huge sigh of relief for Democrats tonight, right? Talk to us about the delay we saw in the vote coming down to just, what, 5.30 or so, 5.45 on the East Coast on a Friday night. Just a few minutes ago, Tom, uh, we're, we're still getting reaction from uh, several of our uh, producers who are outside uh, the House chamber right now, uh, grabbing lawmakers as they exit the House chamber after this historic vote that, you know, Democrats, all 220 Democrats voting in support of this, all 207 Republicans voting against it. And when that vote finally came down, you saw dozens of climate activists that have been uh, camped out on the House steps outside of the uh, the House steps all day, really cheering and high-fiving each other, just a show of support for this. And it was a very long day of debate uh, for these Democrats who, lawmakers in general, really, who came back from this recess to vote here in person. Uh, We saw several delays by uh, House Republicans, including House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, who alone spoke for 50 minutes uh, to try to delay this vote. But at the end of the day, Democrats knew that they could get all of this passed with Dem- with Democrats all together voting for this. Uh, and so this is going to head to President Biden's uh, desk for signature, something that Democrats would like done, obviously, as soon as possible, especially because when you think of the backdrop of today, of this historic vote in legislation, something Democrats have been working on for the better part of a decade, uh, you know, it's, it's undeniable that today came with the overshadowing of this news about the former president and this FBI search of Mar-a-Lago. Actually, the vote on this... Bi- 
piece of legislation started just around the time that that warrant was released. So you can imagine how uh, how eager Democrats are to get this signed and to kind of reel the attention back to this uh, piece of history, Tom. Yeah, most Republicans I know have been on the record saying that it, they don't like the spending and they think it will be inflationary, in fact. How quickly, though, was the president expected to sign this? So we expect uh, Speaker Pelosi to sign off on this. Really, she could do so immediately. Uh, and then it could head to President Biden's desk as early as tonight. Uh, it's unclear whether he'll do so. We know he's in uh, South Carolina, really on vacation right now. So it's unclear whether he'll make a ceremony of it, as we've seen him do with several other pieces of legislation over the past few weeks, the Chips Plus Act, uh, the Burn Pits Bill for Veterans, or whether we'll find out about uh, the signing of this piece of legislation in a statement. Uh, but it could get done by the end of the day at the earliest time. All right. And talk to us about how Democrats are planning to use this legislative win or wins, plural, on the campaign trail in the coming months then. Yeah. Democrats are seeing this really as their golden ticket. They're seeing this as an opportunity to go back to their districts now after this vote is completed and really brag about this new piece of legislation to constituents in their districts. We know that the number one issue for voters in this upcoming uh, midterm elections is inflation and the economy, something that is really hurting Americans right now. And Democrats are making the argument that uh, they're getting act after act passed and, and they're, they're the ones taking action on this to help Americans. And they're painting Republicans uh, as the ones who are distracted by the, the recent news with Trump. We even saw the RNC putting out a statement immediately immediately after uh, this piece of legislation passed, really uh, decrying the same the same uh, accusations and saying vote the Democrats out of Congress because of this. And so this is likely to just heat up as we near uh, these consequential November midterm elections that are going to determine who controls the congressional majorities in both the House and the Senate for the next two years after November, Tom. OK, thanks very much, Ali. I understand the president has just tweeted about this moments ago. I haven't seen it yet pop up on my phone, but we will uh, bring that to you as soon as we can. Other news now, NBC covers hundreds of stories each day. And because you couldn't possibly read, watch or listen to everything, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions. It's a segment we like to call the local. From our Southeast Bureau, what happens to be really, look, it happens to appear rather to be a freak accident in South Carolina. A 63-year-old woman died after being impaled by a beach umbrella. A local coroner says the umbrella was picked up by the wind and it hit the woman in the chest. Some off-duty medical professionals and others nearby tried to help her while waiting for first responders, but she died at the hospital. From our West Coast Bureau, Las Vegas getting hit with flash floods overnight. Social media video shows a bus wading through a flooded intersection. You should know not to do that. And water seeping into a casino and flooding parking garages. It all comes just weeks after torrential rains there caused major damage. According to the National Weather Service, the city has seen its most intense monsoon season in a decade. And out of our Northeast Bureau, Pennsylvania's Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman is back on the campaign trail tonight. The Democratic Senate nominee holding his first rally in the general election campaign since having a stroke back in May. A spokesperson for his campaign says he has mild speech and hearing issues. Fetterman is facing celebrity doctor and GOP nominee Mehmet Oz in November. Other news, the highly anticipated prequel to the Game of Thrones series is set to hit HBO and HBO Max in just over a week now. House of the Dragon takes place 200 years before the Game of Thrones story. The stakes are high, though, for a successful spinoff that's been years in the making. HBO Max is revamping its app ahead of the premiere, promising improved performance. Now, the show is set to go head to head with another highly anticipated prequel to the Lord of the Rings franchise. That's on Amazon. And meanwhile, some streaming services are actually gaining steam. Disney, listen to this, raising its prices for both ad and ad free services on its streaming platforms after Disney Plus added more than 14 million subscribers from April to June. Joining us now for more, CNBC's Julia Borston, who covers all of this out of L.A. Julia, let's start with HBO Max and the uncertainty over how House of the Dragon is going to be perceived. How high are the stakes right now for not only for this new show, but for the, any yeah. future throne series that HBO may be thinking about? 
They, that's absolutely right. The stakes are high for the entire franchise, and also the stakes are high for HBO, HBO Max, as they look to this fall as a key moment to gain subscribers and are, also go head to head with Amazon. Now, I cannot underscore how important Game of Thrones has been for HBO in terms of helping it gain and hold on to subscribers over the years. Game of Thrones, which ran between 2011 and 2019, the most watched show in HBO's history, and the finale, even though the final season was very controversial. A lot of the hardcore fans did not love it. The finale still drew nearly 20 million viewers the night it premiered. And I'm stressing the night it premiered because so much viewing now is spread out. People are watching on demand. But this is the kind of event viewing that HBO Max could really use to drive real-time viewing and drive those subscriber signups. Yeah, so I guess Disney and Disney Plus just actually added more than 14 million subscribers earlier this year, but it's still it's raising the cost of its ad-free service on Disney Plus for for well, let's see what it's three dollars or so per month, I believe it is, right? So how do the two that, go hand in hand? That is a meaningful here? hike. Yeah, yeah, a meaningful hike, a 38 percent increase coming to Disney Plus um, as of uh, a couple months from now. And what's really interesting is they're going to be raising the prices of Disney Plus by three dollars, and then they're going to be introducing a new ad supported Disney Plus because Disney Plus now does not have ads introducing a new ad supported Disney Plus at the same price as what you're paying now for Disney Plus with no ads. So what they're doing here is they're responding to the fact that they know they have demand. They think they introduced Disney Plus at a very low price and they know they have the user demand, those better than expected user additions. And now they're going to say, if you want to pay the same price, you're going to have to watch ads. And I think this plays into a larger conversation here as all of these streamers, they're fighting to hold on to some subscribers and gain subscribers, but they need to make sure they're doing so in a profitable way. All right. So where does the future of streaming go from here, though? Is the fight for subscribers still, it sounds like it's still the goal. It's still the goal. You still want to have the most subscribers possible. And it's worth noting that Disney, if you add up all of its different subscription services, including Hulu and ESPN Plus, along with Disney Plus, they just barely, barely edged ahead of Netflix in terms of total subscribers. But now these streaming services are taking a moment. They're saying it's not just about how many subs we have. It's not about subscriber growth at any cost. We have to be cautious about costs because we've seen Netflix has lost subscribers in the last couple quarters. That was so unprecedented considering their massive growth. So now they're really looking at how to introduce ads as well to hold on to consumers and do it in a profitable way. Julia Borston, thank you. Nobody does it better out of CNBC in Los Angeles. Thank you, Julia. All right, we, as promised, uh, the president has just weighed in on Twitter to Congress passing this mass, massive piece of legislation. He says the following. He says, today the American people won special interest loss with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act in the House. He says families will see lower prescription drug prices, lower health care prices as well, and lower energy costs. He says, I look forward to signing it into law next week. More now. A lot more coming up, actually, on News Now. Are people ordering their coffee with non-dairy milk? Are they about to get a break? Well, at least one vendor out there is offering exactly that, one location. It typically costs more, as you probably know, for a substitute for dairy-free. We're going to get into that just a coming up, just a minute coming up. Time now for the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how the story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. London based coffee giant Pret a Manger is giving NBC News a little more insight into why it decided to eliminate its non dairy milk charge. That's surcharge, actually. The president of Pret a Manger, North America, says she doesn't think it's fair to have a vegan tax. Non-dairy options for coffee have been growing in popularity in recent years. The dairy alternatives market is projected to hit $66 billion by 2030. And a lot of major change you'll find that, in fact, you can choose an alternative to dairy, but it could cost you more, up to a buck more. Some coffee lovers are not happy about it. Pet, uh, call, PETA rather, calls it a fee that penalizes people who avoid animal protections, products, or who are lactose intolerant. NBC's Vicky Nguyen joins me now. I meant to say PETA, not PET. Sorry, Vicky. There's a campaign underway, underway backed by more than 130,000 people. Celebrities, I guess, Paul McCartney are involved in this, taking up this issue. And Starbucks is among them, right, with the surcharge. When you were looking into the story, were you surprised at how big of a push is underway right now? 
Tom, I'm so impressed by your pronunciation of Pret a Manger. It took me <laughs> quite a while to get that right. But yeah, so when this story came up, you know, I'm one of those people that orders the plant based milk out of just a taste preference when I go out and spend the five bucks for a coffee, which isn't that often. But when Kayla Steinberg, the producer, came to pitch this story to me, she brought it up as, you know, this is something people are calling an unfair tax on vegans or a surcharge for people who are lactose intolerant or who avoid dairy because of religious reasons. And I thought, you know, that's fascinating. And then you've got these actors, James Cromwell. You would remember him from Babe. He's also playing uh, a character in the wildly successful series Succession. In May, he glued his hand to a Starbucks counter in New York City to protest this surcharge. So I thought, you know what? A lot of people are probably talking about this. People are affected. And by the way, Tom, the numbers are there. So in 2019, one in 10 Pete's customers ordered a plant-based milk in their coffee drink. By this year, it's one in five. So that's a doubling, right, of the popularity of this milk at one chain. The fact that Pret did something about it and that others have not yet made it enough to, to, for us to spotlight it. So we pay more for a lot of alternatives, right, organic products, plant-based foods. Do you find that when it came to coffee, people were more invested in how much more they were getting charged? Because we all love our coffee, right? Yeah, Tom. So that's where it started out. Initially, people were really grateful to even be offered the choice of a plant-based milk. They were like, wow, you've got almond or oat or soy. Fantastic. I'll, I'll pay an extra buck for that, right? Now, as these milks are gaining more popularity, you said it, you know, it's a $66 billion industry projection. People are less tolerant of this extra fee. And then as they see that it seems rather unfair, according to the National Institutes of Health, Worldwide, about two thirds of people have uh, lactose malabsorption. It means you cannot digest lactose. And here in the U.S., that affects people of color, indigenous people, black people, uh, Native American people, Asian people, Hispanic people, disproportionately. So now you've got these other layers to this latte, Tom. All right, real quickly, I got just 20 seconds. Do you think that this is going to continue to snowball and the pressure is on, in fact, other chains to do something? That is 100% the hope. Pret says it cost them 50% more to provide this. Some critics pointed to the fact that they raised the prices on their other drinks. For now, Pete's and Starbucks say it costs them more for this milk, so that's why they charge more. But the hope is this attention will, will raise consumers' voices and get these chains to reconsider. Tom? All right, Vicki, thank you. That's it for NBC News Now at this hour, and we will have much more for you on Monday, same time, same place. Our coverage resumes right now.